Welcome to Vigilant News. Justin here, and I have Ryan, of course, to my right. How's it going, Ryan? Wonderful, Justin. Thanks for asking. We've got a special situation we want to talk to you about, about Ukraine. Ryan, you prepared something. What do you got for us? Well, I've been, you know, kind of mulling this over since I first saw the invasion late, uh, what was it, Tuesday night, Wednesday night? Um, and <clears throat> I've just been kind of writing my own thoughts down about it. Figured, you know, I might as well. I'm no expert on the inner workings of Russia and Ukraine governments, though I do have a decent understanding of certain aspects of both in regards to their connections with globalist institutions, etc. cetera. Uh, so I am by no means an authority, but fortunately for me, you don't have to be an authority on something to have an opinion on it. So mm -hmm. I figured I might as well just toss it out there and you guys can consider what you will. Okay. So I wrote a lot of this down. I'm gonna read it to you so I don't miss any of the points. Uh, we already are seeing a swarm of media stories in Western nations trying to outline the complexity of the relationship between Russia and Ukraine, which is a very complex situation, as it has been for years, uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, while ignoring certain inconvenient truths, as the mainstream media is like to do. Uh, you'll see many of these stories construct narrative, which then oversimplifies the situation and paints Russia as a monstrous aggressor, which is an aggressor, but, you know, it's also just as much a country full of corruption as any other country. So the goal will be to convince the public that our involvement in Ukraine is a moral and geopolitical necessity. There will be attempts to gain American favor and to call a U.S. boots on the ground type uh, situation. Joe Biden will be at the forefront of this push. A wartime president always gets higher approval ratings and he needs them more than anyone ever has. So we've already got officials coming out of the Munich Security Conference, which literally just happened, talking about how they've never seen more unity among our allies or our two parties in Congress, which is actually not a good thing, contrary to how palatable it sounds. Uh, there's an old George Carlin adage that went something like, whenever both parties are in agreement on something, that means there is an extra good screwing coming your way. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. So swirl that around softly and gently in your mouth and see how it tastes. Twitter is working overtime to counter emerging narratives, meaning that just like COVID-19 and 9-11, there is only one way you can look at this thing. No other, no room for nuance, you know, no room for multidimensional thinking. So again, I'm not an expert on the inner workings of what's going on or hip to the latest Russian and Ukrainian intelligence, but I can look at the signs based on semi-recent events that globalist fingerprints are all over this situation. Uh, so I'll try to paint the picture as best I can. Uh, it could be said that Russia has a history of hypocritical behavior when it comes to involvement in the affairs of its neighbors. For example, only a few months ago, Kazakhstan was facing mass protests, which the government claimed were caused by foreign manipulation. Mm. Zero proof was presented to justify this assertion. However, the claim was enough to rationalize the deployment of 2,300 Russian troops to the borders to shut down the protests. In reality, citizens of Kazakhstan were angry over a spike in inflation and a high gas prices, which continue to grind down the middle class and those in poverty. Sound mm -hmm. familiar? The reasons for civil unrest were obvious and justified, but the protesting Kazakhs were accused of being pawns of foreign enemies. Hmm. Sound familiar? Yeah. Sound familiar. <laughs> this is a typical strategy of corrupt governments trying to retain power when the people rise up, realize their own power, and rebel for legitimate reasons. Mm -hmm. Look at all the blue collar pro-freedom types, even sitting presidents being maligned as victims of Russian propaganda, straight from the playbook of an international amalgamated ruling class. Imagine the Canadian government under Trudeau asked for US military assistance in scattering the trucker protesters against draconian vaccine mandates. We need to look at these decisions in context in order to grasp how truly insane they are. Mm. Ironically, Russia is happy to support the unrest of separatists in Ukraine while also helping to silence the unrest of those in Kazakhstan. Keep this pattern in mind because it will help to understand how events surrounding Russia reflect a global trend that might affect Americans in the near future. Mm -hmm. The diplomatic mess between Ukraine and Russia can be blamed in part on both sides and just like anything. Uh, it's this kind of historical ambiguity where globalists tend to thrive. The fog of war helps to obscure establishment activities, and uh, often it's hard for people to see what is truly 
and who is truly being benefited from the chaos until it's too late and everything has already happened. Yeah, I mean, today was no situation or no exception because we had conflicting reports of supposed bombs going off, but they're not going off according to Russian sources. You know, and we, as observers, we get very little data. So it's like, what should we believe? What shouldn't we believe? And God forbid we question anything that we can't do that according to Twitter. So now how about the Ukrainian intelligence burning all those documents? That's right. I forgot to pull that video. Anyway, yeah. Burisma, mm -hmm. maybe, mm -hmm. and all kinds of other things, you know. Uh, so I don't think there's anything unique to the Ukraine conflict for the globalists. They could have just easily tried to initiate a regional war in Taiwan, North Korea, Iran, etc. The numerous powder keg countries that they have been cultivating for a couple of decades now. We should not hyper focus on who is to blame between Ukraine and Russia. We should focus on the effects that will result from any major regional disaster and how the globalists exploit such catastrophes to further the agenda for the total centralization of power. That's what we should be focused on, not mm. who's right and who's wrong, which side are we gonna take? You know, Our tribalist nature wants us to do that, but they're, they're capitalizing on that. Right, right. The Ukraine scenario could be easily diffused if both sides took some basic dipl diplomatic measures. If, if we're to buy what the story were being sold, that could be an outcome, mm. uh, but this isn't gonna happen. NATO officials could take a step back from their pursuit of adding Ukraine to the ranks. The U.S. could stop pouring cash and weapons into Ukraine to the tune of $5.4 billion since 2014, when Obama had his false flag in Ukraine. Over 90 tons of military equipment have been sent to the country in 2022 alone. 90 tons of military equipment. Russia could not stop sending covert, Russia could stop sending covert special operations units into Donbass, Donbass and, the, and uh, be more willing to come to the table to discuss diplomatic solutions. The reason these things do not happen is because they are not allowed to happen by the power brokers behind the curtain. We should all be well aware of the globalist influences behind the US and NATO leaders. We present evidence of this on a regular basis on this show. Biden's penchant for globalist institutions is not some big secret, but what about Russia? Some of us in the alternative media are pro and pro-freedom crowds, crowds believe Russia to be anti-globalist, while others think that it is either a false narrative or Russian propaganda and that they are in fact quite globalist. I personally don't believe I am qualified to say one way or the other. Uh, I believe the truth probably lays somewhere in the middle. Putin has used anti-globalist rhetoric. Uh, so do many political leaders. <laughs> But if we are to base our opinions on Putin's relationships, then it starts to paint a different picture. In his own manuscript, The First Person, he praised Henry Kissinger. As he rose through the political ranks in Russia, he developed a steady friendship with Kissinger and to this day has regular lunches with Kissinger and has even made him an advisor to the Kremlin. It doesn't stop there. Putin has engaged in steady dialogue with the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab. In fact, only last year, Russia announced it would be joining the World Economic Forum's Fourth Industrial Revolution Network, which focuses on economic socialization, AI, and the Internet of Things, basically all thing technocratic tyranny. So is it, is it because he's on board with all this, or is it a keep your enemies close kind of thing? I don't know. That's you know up to whoever to decide for themselves. It is worth mentioning that all this falls into what could be called the false East-West paradigm, the fraudulent notion that the globalist agenda is a purely Western or American agenda and that countries like China and Russia are opposed to it. If you look at, it, at the close interactions between the East and the globalists, this idea completely falls apart. So the strategy, <clears throat> order out of chaos, is nothing new. It's something the globalists have been doing for a very long time. The number of open revelations post-COVID about the Great Reset that globalists have publicly admitted to is so staggering that their plans can no longer be denied. Any skeptics to this point are just dissociated from the information completely or have comprehension issues probably due to a distracting society that we inhabit. Yeah, yeah. So how do they benefit from initiating a crisis between these powers over Ukraine? What do they get out of it? Uh, this will get a little into my own personal speculation, which I am not married to, and I'm always open to deepening my understanding of truth. So correct me where you perceive me to be wrong, please. Uh, I have noted in several articles, it appears to me that Ukraine is a plan B attempt to conjure more smoke and mirrors where the COVID pandemic failed to satisfy the Great Reset Plan. Mm. 
as Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum have constantly asserted, they saw the pandemic as the perfect opportunity to force the fourth industrial revolution on the world. As globalist Rahm Emanuel once opened in the wake of the 2008 economic crash, you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. And what I mean by that is it's an opportunity to do the things that you think you could not do before. And Rahm Emanuel is part of that whole, you know, Chicago, windy politician, Obama, criminal political gang. So the World Economic Forum is an old hand at this tactic. Klaus Schwab used the same exact language right after the crash of 2008 as he has used after the spread of COVID, always trying to sell global governance as the solution to every disaster. Quote, what we are experiencing is the birth of a new era. Wake up, a wake up call to overhaul our institutions, our systems, and above all, our thinking and to adjust our attitudes and values to the needs of a world which rightly expects a much higher degree of responsibility and accountability, he explained. If we recognize this crisis as being really transformational, we can lay the fundaments for a more stable, more sustainable, and more prosperous world. Uh, that was called Schwab at the Global Redesign Initiative in 2009. Mm. It seems as though Schwab jumped the gun back when he, uh, back then, just as he jumped the gun in 2020 when he declared the Great Reset as an inevitability in the face of COVID. The globalists must have expected a much higher death rate from the virus because they were practically dancing in the streets, elated over the amount of power that they could steal in the name of protecting the public from a global health threat. If you look at the World Economic Forum and Gates Foundation's simulation of the COVID pandemic event 201, which was held only two months before the real thing happened, they expected COVID to do way more damage, predicting an initial death tally of 65 million. This never happened. It wasn't even close. It's hard to say why an obvious bioweapon like COVID failed to do the job. Viruses tend to mutate rapidly in the wild and behave differently than they do in a lab setting. I would even consider the possibility of divine intervention. Whatever the reason, the globalists did not get what they wanted, and now they need yet another crisis to oil the gears of the reset machine. Mm -hmm. With the already tiny death rate of COVID now dropping even further with the Omicron variant in half the states of the U.S. in full defense of the vax mandates, it is only a matter of time before the rest of the world asks why they are still under medical authoritarianism. War in Ukraine and the mere threat of that war expanding beyond the region could accomplish a number of things COVID has not. It provides an ongoing cover for the stagflationary collapse, which is now in full swing in the US, the supply chain problems that continue globally, as well as the destabilization of the European economy. In particular, the EU is strongly reliant on Russian natural gas, especially Germany, mm -hmm. in order to heat homes and maintain its economy. Russia has strangled natural gas supplies to Europe in the past, and they will do it again. Russian oil exports also fill demand gaps globally, and these exports will be strangled by the sanctions or by the Kremlin deliberately cutting supplies to certain nations. Uh, Putin probably sees as Russia will be okay regardless. Even if they get cut off of the SWIFT system, they'll probably be fine. In the U.S. and in many other Western nations, which have large number of people still defending individual freedom, the globalists clearly want to use tensions with Russia as a means to silent public dissent over authoritarian policies. Already, we are seeing numerous instances of the establishment officials and leftists on social media suggesting that liberty activists are just pawns of Russia and that they are being used to divide and conquer. This is nonsense backed by nothing, but they are trying out the narrative anyway to see if it sticks because they've been hearing it for so long from the likes of Hillary Clinton, Adam Schiff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I have no doubt that any rebellion in the US against the globalists will be blamed on foreign interference. As mentioned earlier, the last thing the elites want is movements of free people obstructing the reset in the name of liberty. That's right. We witnessed this in Canada where Trudeau announced unilateral emergency powers against the trucker protest, giving himself totalitarian levels of control. Even the Russian government has intervened in such public actions to prevent any kind of activist momentum. Biden will try to do the same thing and war, even a smaller regional war, gives him a rationale to oppose dissent in the name of public security. Interestingly, martial law in the US is also much easier to legally and historically justify for a government as long as it is done in response to the invasion of a foreign enemy. 
the Russian influence narrative may very well be in preparation for martial law within America. Mm. Whether or not this actually succeeds is another matter, it's just speculation. The consequences of a shooting event in Ukraine will be far reaching, well beyond a distraction for the American public. The intent here is not to suggest only Americans will be infected, affected. My point is that there are certain places in the world that are naturally resistant to, to the globalist scheme, and the freedom-minded Americans are a primary obstacle. If there is a large-scale rebellion against the Great Reset, it's going to start here in America. The globalists know this well, which is why the U.S. will undoubtedly be centrally involved in the Ukraine quagmire. While the event would be disastrous for Ukrainians and probably many Russians, there are deeper and more dangerous underlying threats intended for the US and a war in Ukraine acts as an effective scapegoat for many of them. And there you have it folks, so just some wandering thoughts. Well, it's all good stuff to think about because it reinforces that we don't really know what's going on exactly, but we do know that there are established interests that are trying to take advantage of every crisis that pops up, even if they have to manufacture them. So. so we can get caught up in, you know, the fervor, the 9-11, like, let's go get them kind of attitude, but don't let that distract from what's really going on here. And that is a great reset, a fourth industrial revolution type thing run and controlled by globalists. That's right. Yeah. We have a, a technocratic uh, set of globalists who use things like Twitter, the internet, Google search results, mainstream news articles, music, movies, you name it, to influence our thinking, to push their agenda. I have no doubt that's what's happening here. So uh, definitely good to stay vigilant given all these things for sure. So awesome. Well, with that, uh, we will um, definitely go ahead and post this here soon. The, uh, um, the links in the description are for our promotions that we have. Don't forget to sign up for the newsletter of our website, vigilant.news, so you can bypass the censorship. We're sending out those emails every day when we do a video so you can get your updates there and don't forget to hop on that telegram too if you get the chance exactly that's growing like uh, crazy so with that thanks so much everybody greatly appreciate all your support and we'll see you on the next one take care